Amen. All right, well, we're there in 2 Peter chapter number 1, and we've been going through a series on Sunday nights entitled Declaring Doctrine, and we've been going through this comprehensive and systematic uh, series where we're just going to be taking the, the major doctrines of the Bible and just breaking, breaking them down on Sunday nights, and this is going to be a, a, a longer series than, than what we normally do, uh, but I think it's important that we not be carried about with every wind of doctrine and we're taking the time to go through it. If you remember, we started in week one with the importance of doctrine, and then in week two, we learned about the doctrine of revelation, how God reveals himself to mankind. Then we talked about specific revelation, and we talked about the doctrine of the Word of God. And we've been kind of dealing with the Word of God, because look, when it comes to Christianity, the Word of God is a big deal. Uh, and, and there's a lot to be said about it and things I want us to know about it. I want you to know about it. So we talked about the doctrine of the Word of God and went through the doctrinal teachings on that, inspiration, preservation, illumination. And then last week, if you remember, I preached a sermon entitled, entitled What is the Bible? And we just kind of broke down the Bible. We talked about how it's organized and its origins, the organization of the Bible and the origins of the Bible. Tonight, we're going to continue with this idea of the Word of God. And tonight, we're answering this question, is the Bible reliable? Is the Bible reliable? And you're there in 2 Peter chapter number 1, and I'd like you to look down at verse number 16. From verses 16 through 21, we have Peter basically writing about the Bible, and he's telling us about the reliability of the Bible. Notice there in verse 16, he says, For we not have followed uh, cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Notice, I want you to notice that in verse 16, he talks about the fact that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And then in verse 19, he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So in verse 16 he says, look, we're not following cunningly devised fables. In verse uh, 19 he tells us, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And then in verse 20 he tells us that the Bible is not given for any one person's uh, uh, from any one person's perspective or for their own use. It's for everyone knowing, uh, no, notice verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. Why is it not of any private interpretation? For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you notice that these, this passage, verses 16 to 21 here, all have to do with the Word of God. And what I'm going to do tonight, we're actually just going to walk through this passage. I'm going to break it down for you, and we're going to uh, study it together. And we're going to learn about the reliability of the Scriptures. Is the Bible reliable? And again, I've been telling you this the, uh, since we started this series. These sermons on Sunday nights on doctrine, they're going to feel a little different than, than a normal sermon that you might be used to on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday night or on a Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, in, in the old IFB, they, they had the Sunday school hour where they would take the time to kind of teach through some things. We obviously don't believe in... And, and separating families, and we're family integrated and all that, but we're kind of taking this evening slot as, as kind of a Sunday school type hour where we're teaching and just kind of breaking down some of these things and helping you understand these things, and I think it's important for you, look, you believe the Word of God by faith, and you should believe the Word of God by faith, but it's important for us to also know that logically speaking, we have a reliable Bible. So we're going to answer this question, is the Bible reliable? And I'm going to give you a statement that I'm going to give it to you broken down, and then at the end of the sermon, we'll put it all together, and it'll kind of be a statement that explains to us why the Bible is reliable. So I'd like you to write this down. If you don't have a baby sitting on your lap or something like that, you've got a place uh, to write down notes on the chorus of your week on the back. And I'd like you to write down this statement. Here's the, the first statement. It's going to be a series of statements that we'll put together. How do we know that the Bible is reliable? How do we know that the Bible is reliable? Number one, the Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. You need to understand that the Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. Now, if you look down at verse 16 again, notice what Peter says. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. What does that mean? The word cunningly 
means to be subtle, means to be sly, means to be able to kind of deceive somebody or trick someone or kind of throw something in there without somebody noticing. And Peter says, look, when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to what we believe, he says, we've not followed cunningly devised. What's the word devised means? It means contrived or invented, something that's made up. He says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. What's a fable? It's a story. It's, it's something that's not true. It's just kind of a story you tell. He says, look, what we are following, Peter would say, what we believe is not just some story that was invented and it's kind of subtle and it's kind of sly and it's kind of tricked us into believing. He says, we have not uh, followed cunningly devised fables. And I would say to you tonight, and I would submit to you tonight, for those of you that believe the Bible and believe the Word of God, you are not putting your faith in a cunningly devised fable. In fact, the Bible, not only by spiritual standards, now look, by spiritual standards, we believe the Bible is the Word of God, period. It is inspired by God, it is preserved by God, it was spoken by God. Spiritually speaking, our spirit testifies when we read the Bible that these are indeed the words of God. We understand that. But I want you to understand even further that even, even aside from the spiritual aspect, just for a minute, Think in a secular sense, even if you were to remove the spiritual aspect, the God aspect of the Bible, the Bible just as a book. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm telling you. The Bible is the Word of God. We ought to treat it as the Word of God. We ought to respect it as the Word of God. But please understand this argument. Even if we were to just set aside God and just play the devil's advocate and say, oh, the Bible's not a spiritual book, it wasn't written by God, we're atheists, we don't believe that. The Bible as a book is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. Now let me explain that to you, and go, go to the book of Psalms if you would. Keep your place there in Second Peter, that's our text for tonight. We're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it. So put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there so you can get back to it. Second Peter chapter 1. And go to the book of Psalms. If you open up your Bible just right in the center, you'll more than likely fall in the book of Psalms. Psalm 68. The Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. Let's talk about the reliability of the Bible as an ancient document. Because look, here's the thing. This, this Bible you hold in your hands, I don't know if you've realized this or you've thought about this, it's an ancient document. The New Testament was written over 2,000 years ago. Uh, the, the Old Testament goes back uh, way further than that. This is an ancient document. And the Bible, as an ancient document, is a reliable ancient document. In fact, it doesn't get any more reliable than the Bible. And, at, and right now, I'm just talking about just from a secular, even just from a, a logical, worldly point of view. Let me give you some examples. The New Testament. And the New Testament is really the battleground when it comes to reliability because the Old Testament, it's kind of the, the, the children of Israel, they did a good job with scribes and things like that. There's not a lot of debate. There's a few things that are debated by, uh, there. But when it comes to the reliability of Scripture, it's really the New Testament that the focus is on because of the writers and the manuscripts and all those things. And here's what I want you to understand. Your New Testament, the New Testament that you and I hold in our hands, that New Testament was translated, and right now, right now on earth, there exist about 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. So the, the Bible that you hold in your hand, it was translated by this accumulation of manuscripts and portions of manuscripts. And right now we own, we have in this world, about 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. Now you need to understand this. We do not have the originals. Nobody has the originals. When people talk to you about going back to the originals, they're either lying to you or they're just ignorant. The, the originals do not exist. Nobody owns the original document that, was writ, that the book of Romans was written on. Nobody owns the original documents that the gospel according to John. They don't exist. We have copies from those documents, and we have about 6,000 manuscripts or portion of manuscripts. Now, here's what I want you to understand, and I want you to think about this and put your thinking cap on for a minute. We have 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts. Nobody has the originals. The originals don't exist, but here's what we do have. We have documents that date back as far as 180 and one, to 120 AD. 
Now, here's why that's important. Most people agree that the New Testament was completed somewhere between 70 and 100 AD. I tend to believe 70 AD was the number. Some people will take it as far as 100 AD. But most people agree that the New Testament, all right? Remember, the calendar begins with the death, of, uh, uh, with, the, with the birth of Christ, excuse me. And, 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 and that's where you start counting 180, 280, 380. Most people believe that the New Testament was completed between 70 and 100. 100 AD. We have manuscripts that go back to 100 to and 120 AD. Here's what that means. That means that we have manuscripts that exist right now that date back anywhere from 30 to 50 years after the originals. Meaning that we have manuscripts right now that you can look at that were copied 30 to 50 years after Paul penned down and Peter penned down and John penned down and Luke penned down the originals of the New Testament. Now, you might think, well, that's all well and good, but what does that prove? Well, when you compare it to other ancient documents, and when you talk about ancient documents in this world, and, and the world has a lot of studies that they've done on this, and they, they, they're big into this. There's whole universities that have departments uh, with this. And there are other ancient documents, aside from the Bible, that uh, th by the world standards and by secular standards are considered reliable documents. Let me give you three examples of very well-known ancient documents. One is uh, Aristotle's Poetics. Now, Aristotle's Poetics is the earliest surviving work of uh, dramatic theory. It was written by Aristotle ab around 330 BC, so about 330 years before the birth of Christ. That would make it an ancient document that's about 2,350 years old, or it was written 2,350 years ago. So please understand this. Aristotle's Poetics written about 2,350 years ago. Today, there are five manuscripts in existence. There are five manuscripts in existence of Aristotle's Poetics written 2,350 years ago. And please understand this. The earliest manuscript of those five manuscripts was copied over 1,400 years after the original. Now, by the world standards, by the world standards, Aristotle's Poetics is a reliable ancient document. And if you were to ask them, why are you so confident in the reliability of that document, they would tell you, well, we've got five uh, manuscripts, and the earliest is, was copied 1,400 years after the original, and they would tell you, for a document that's 2,000 plus years old, that's pretty good. Let me give you another example. Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars. Gaelic Wars is a book written by Julius Caesar, and it was his first-hand commentary and account of the Gaelic Wars. It is Caesar's, in it, uh, Caesar describes the battles that took place in the nine years that he spent fighting the Germanic peoples and the Celtic people, and it's a book written by Julius Caesar, which makes it an ancient document. It was written 58 to 52 BC, that would be around 2,070 years ago. It's an ancient document. Today, there are 10 manuscripts in existence. 10 manuscripts in existence of the Gaelic Wars by Julius Caesar. The earliest manuscript was copied over 1,000 years after the original. Let me give you another example. Homer's Iliad. The Iliad is an ancient Greek epic poem attributed to Homer set during the Trojan War and the 10-year siege of the city of Troy, written in 762 B.C., 762 years before Christ. That would make it about 2,782 years old or 2,700 years ago. Today, there are 643 manuscripts in existence. That's a pretty good amount, 643 manuscripts in existence. The earliest manuscript was copied over 1,800 years after the original. And here's all I want you to understand. By secular worldly standards, when you're looking at a document that is 2,000, 2,500, 
2,700 years ago, they would tell you these are reliable documents. Uh, they would point to Homer's Iliad. They would tell you 643 manuscripts, the earliest uh, copied 1,800 years after the original. They would point to Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars. They would tell you we have 10 manuscripts, the earliest copied over 1,000 years after the original. They would point to Aristotle's Poetics. They would tell you we have five manuscripts, the earliest copied over 1,400 years after the original. Your New Testament has six, not hundred, thousand manuscripts. The earliest copied 30 to 50 years after the original. I'm telling you, your New Testament by any standard is a reliable ancient document. In fact, if the Bible is not a reliable ancient document, then there is no such thing as a reliable ancient document because the Bible blows every other ancient document out of the water. Amen. Somebody put it this way. If it was a fight, they'd stop it. They would not allow it to go, to, 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 to go forward because the, the Bible is such a heavyweight when it comes to the reliability. Look, you've got 643 of the manuscripts of Homer's Iliad, 6,000 of the New Testament. Five and ten of the other ones copied a thousand, fourteen hundred, eighteen hundred years after the original. Your Bible, six thousand manuscripts. We don't have the originals, we'll give you that. The earliest copy, thirty to fifty years after the original. And when you take God out of the picture and you just look at the Bible as an ancient document, it is a collection of reliable ancient documents. It is a collection of reliable ancient documents. Just for, forget the God factor, and we believe in God and we understand that, but just the Bible as a book, it is not only reliable, it is the most reliable. It blows every other ancient document out of the water. It's a reliable ancient document. But I want you to notice, not only is it a reliable ancient document, but it is a reliable historic document. Now, you're there in Psalms. I'd like you to go to the book of Daniel, if you would. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. All right, so make your way to Daniel. And while you go there, I want to read to you from a couple of articles. The first article is entitled, The Fabled Hittites. And I'll go ahead and just read you a little bit of this while you turn to Daniel. Bible critics had long sneered at references in the Bible to a people called the Hittites. Their opinion was that the Hittites were simply one of many mythical people made up by Bible writers. Other critics said that they may have been a small and unimportant tribe, but the critics were off. Toward the end of the 19th century, Hittite monuments were uncovered at Carchemish on the Euphrates River in Syria, proving the Bible right. Later in 1906, excavations of Boghaz Khoi, which is ancient Hattusas, the capital of the Hittite Empire in Turkey, uncovered thousands of Hittite documents revealing a wealth of information about Hittite history and culture. The centuries-old Hittite rubbish showed they were a real and formidable power. They were once one of the dominant peoples of Asia Minor and the Near East. They existed, uh, they, they exercised, excuse me, considerable control south into Syria and Palestine. The Bible was right all along. Today, no one questions the existence of the Hittites. Volumes of books exist on the history, art, culture, and society of the Hittites. Now, we could spend all day going through example after example of things that the Bible talked about that historians said that was a myth, that never actually happened, and later it, be, it became apparent that the Bible was true. I just want to give you a couple, but that's an example where for a long time people said, oh, the Hittites never existed. They're just a mythical people. Uh, Moses made them up in his writings, and then all of a sudden they found just thousands of artifacts and documents that prove that these people were exactly when and where the Bible said they were. Because I want you to know, the Bible is not only an, a, a reliable ancient document, the Bible is a reliable historic document. Let me give you another example. This is from an article uh, entitled Nebuchadnezzar versus Belshazzar. The Bible presents the famous writing on the wall story as occurring on the same day the city of Babylon, capital of Babylonia, fell to the Medo-Persian Empire under King Cyrus the Great. Indeed, 
Daniel gave King Belteshazzar this interpretation of writing. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. In Daniel 5, 26, and thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In verse 28, the Bible claims that Belteshazzar was killed in that night. In verse 30, and with his death, the Babylonian kingdom was now controlled by Medo-Persia. However, all other known historical records once disagreed. Ancient historians like Herodotus, uh, Meg, Asthenes, Barosis, and Alexander Polyhistor, not to mention a vast number of cuneiform documents, were united in claiming that the last king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire was Nebuchadnezzar. Belteshazzar was not even mentioned anywhere except in the book of Daniel and literature derived from it. But just when it looked like all the evidence was stacked against the scriptures, a series of archaeological discoveries showed that Belteshazzar did exist after all, and the details given about him in the Bible are profoundly correct. First, in 1854, four clay cylinders with identical inscriptions were excavated from the Ur. These Nebuchadnezzar cylinders contained Nebuchadnezzar's prayer to the moon god for Belteshazzar, the eldest son, my offspring. Thus, Belteshazzar's existence was confirmed as Nebuchadnezzar's first son and heir to his throne. Then, in 1882, a translation of another ancient cuneiform text, the Nebuchadnezzar Chronicle, was published. According to this document, Nebuchadnezzar was a mostly absentee king, spending 10 years of his 17-year reign living in Tima, Arabia, 450 miles away from Babylon. The king left Belteshazzar, whom the text calls the crown prince, to take care of the affairs in Babylon during that time. Also, the chronicle explains that Nebuchadnezzar was away from Babylon when it fell. Two days earlier, he had fled from the Persians when they defeated him in Sippar. So Belteshazzar was the highest authority in Babylon at the time of its capture. So for years and years and years, people would scoff at the book of Daniel and say, there's a major historical problem here. Belteshazzar was not the last king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was. Every other historical document agrees with that and agrees against the Bible. Then an archaeological find finds that Nebuchadnezzar uh, had left, had basically been an absentee king, and had left Belteshazzar in charge, his son. Here's what's interesting. When you look at the story of Daniel with that in mind, there are things in the story that make a lot more sense. Are you there in Daniel chapter 5? Look at verse 7. Remember, you've got the story of the handwriting on the wall, where the hand of God appears on the wall, and he, he's giving that uh, 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 warning and that last judgment to Belteshazzar. Daniel 5 and verse 7, the Bible says this, The king cried aloud to bring in astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. This is Belteshazzar. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck. Now notice, here you have Belteshazzar who just saw the handwriting on the wall. He sees this message, but he doesn't know what it means. He calls in all the wise men of Babylon and he's telling them, Whoever can read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, he said, I'm going to give them, uh, they shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck. Notice the last part of verse 7, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And you might wonder, well, why? You know, that's kind of an odd thing. You're, why, why don't you make him the second ruler in the kingdom? Well, when you realize that Belteshazzar was already the second ruler in the kingdom, it makes sense that he would offer the third position of, of king. In fact, notice verse number 16. When they bring in Daniel to bring him, give him the interpretation, knows what Belteshazzar says. He says, And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof. Thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck. Notice what he says. And shall be the third in the ruler, uh, ruler in the kingdom. Notice verse 29, same chapter. After Daniel gives him the interpretation. Then commanded Belteshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third 
ruler in the kingdom. And here's what the interesting thing is, that people would scoff at the book of Daniel and make fun of Daniel until history caught up with the book of Daniel and proved the book of Daniel to be right. And now that we know that amount of history, it actually makes the book of Daniel make even more sense. Because in the story, he keeps offering, the th- I'll make you the third ruler in the kingdom. I'll make you the third ruler. Uh, Daniel, you're not going to be the third ruler. And you're kind of like, well, why, why not the second? Well, Belshazzar was the second. And here's all I'm trying to tell you, and here's the point that I'm trying to make. Your Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. Your Bible, all on its own, forget the spirituality aspect of it. And when I say forget that, I hope you understand what I mean. I'm not being disrespectful. Of course, it is the Word of God. But even aside, even aside from its claim as the Word of God, just as a document, it is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents. Here's the next part of the statement I'd like you to write down, number two. The Bible is a collection of reliable and, and uh, reliable ancient and historic documents, here's point number two, that were documented by eyewitnesses. The Bible is a collection of reliable and ancient, reliable ancient and historic documents that were documented by eyewitnesses. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1 if you would. Look at verse number 16. Notice what Peter says to us. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly, cunningly devised fables. Notice what he says. And look, isn't that true? I mean, you can call the Bible a lot of things, but you can't call it a cunningly devised fable. It is a reliable ancient document by any standard. It is a reliable historic document by any standard. But not only is the Bible a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents, they were documented, and it was documented by eyewitnesses. Notice what Peter says. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Notice, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, by eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter says, look, we were eyewitnesses. We were witnesses of what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this idea of the resurrection being attested by eyewitnesses is a theme through the entire New Testament. Let me give you a couple of examples. Go to Luke chapter number 1. Luke 1, in the, towards the beginning of the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter number 1. Do me a favor, when you get to Luke, put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there, because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it. Luke chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1. For as much, this is Luke writing the book of Luke, and this is kind of his introduction to the book. Here's what he says. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order the decla- a declaration of those things, which are most, assured, was are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were, notice what he says, eyewitnesses. Do you understand what he said? He said, look, for as much as many have has taken in hand to set forth in order, he says, look, there's lots of people that have taken it upon themselves to put in order a declaration of those things. What things, look, Luke, the things which we surely believe among us. He says, even as they were delivered, even as they delivered them unto us. He says, look, they were delivered unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Here's what Luke is saying. The document that I'm about to write that will later be known as the gospel according to Luke is that I want you to know that this document came, this is a witness, I've got the testimony from eyewitnesses who saw these things, verse 3, he says, it seemed good to me, having made a uh, perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. The book of Luke and Acts was written to this man, Theophilus, by Luke, And here's what he's telling you. He's saying, I got the story from the eyewitnesses. I documented it, put it in order, and I'm giving it to you. Why? Look at verse 4. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Peter said, we were eyewitnesses. Luke said, I got this from the eyewitnesses. He said, this has been documented by the eyewitnesses. Keep your place there in Luke. We're going to come right back to it. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, you're there in Luke, you've got John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. And please understand this. 
And I hope people understand this when I say this, and I think it's important for us to get this. The Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We must come to God by faith, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We understand that faith is, is we walk by faith and not by sight. We understand all that. The Bible teaches all that. We're clear on all that. But please understand, though we walk by faith and not by sight, though faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the, and the evidence of things not seen, excuse me, though all of that is true, God never expected you and I to have blind faith. In fact, he gave us eyewitness faith. He gave us faith. We could put faith in the reliability of the document known as the gospel according to Luke, in the reliability of the document known as the gospel according to John, the reliability of the documents of the New Testament, because we got the message from eyewitnesses. And this is a theme in your New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice what Paul says. Look at verse 1. He says, moreover, brethren, now 1 Corinthians 15 is known as the resurrection uh, chapter. It's all about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of believers. And notice how he begins this chapter. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are saved. So he says, look, I'm going to declare to you the gospel. He says, this is the gospel that I preached to you. This is the gospel that you've received. This is the gospel wherein you stand. This is the gospel that got you saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So what is the gospel? Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here he goes. He says how that Christ, number one, died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he, number two, was buried. And he, number three, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He says this is the gospel. This is what we believe, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. But then notice what, Peter, or what Paul says about the resurrection of Christ. He doesn't say, so just take it as my word that this actually happened. No, he gives them eyewitness testimony. Notice verse 5, and that he was Seen of Cephas, talking about the resurrected Christ, was seen of Cephas, that's Simon Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. And I want you to know that's important. He's saying 500 people saw Jesus all at the same time. After they watched him die and be buried, then they all saw him, 500 of them saw him alive. And then, uh, and then Paul writes, and most of them are still alive today at the time of this writing. Paul would say, well, I'm writing this letter to the Corinthian church. Most of those people, he says, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. He says that group of 500 people that saw Jesus, most, some of them have fallen asleep. Some of them have died, but most of them are alive, Peter, or Paul would say, right now, as, he, as he's writing the, the, to the church at Corinth. Notice verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, that's the half-brother of Christ. Then of all the apostles, that's more than the 12, it's the 70. Notice verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me. Also, as one born out of due time, because we know that Jesus appeared, the resurrected Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Here's all I'm telling you. The Bible is a collection of reliable ancient historic documents that was documented by eyewitnesses. Luke said, I got this from the eyewitnesses. He said, I got it from the horse's mouth. He, Peter said, I was an eyewitness. Paul here gives us a whole list of all of the eyewitnesses. He said, there are 500 eyewitnesses that are, uh, that whom the greater part remain unto this present. He said, but some are falling asleep. This Bible was given to us, and specifically the New Testament, the Gospels. They were documented by eyewitnesses. Now, here's what's interesting about that, Okay. Because a lot of people want to attack the eyewitness account. And look, eyewitness account can be very unreliable when we're talking about people being sentenced and things like that. What's interesting is that there's been a lot of research done on eyewitness account. In fact, there's a, uh, an article, and I'm not going to read the article to you, but there's an article entitled, Eyewitness Testimonies May Only Be Credible Under These Circumstances. This was an article written by, uh, student, or by UC Davis, and it was a study done by UC Davis 
in corroboration with the Houston Police Department back in 2013, where they uh, did a study regarding 348 robberies. And here's what they found. They found that sometimes eyewitness testimony is very unreliable, but it can be extremely reliable under certain circumstances. And this is what they found. Go back to Luke chapter 1 if you would. They found that there are three things that make eyewitness testimony completely reliable or extremely reliable. The first thing they found was this, that eyewitness testimony is reliable when it is in corroboration with other eyewitness accounts or evidence. So if you've got one person saying, I saw him do it, that may be unreliable. But when you've got multiple eyewitnesses that are all saying, no, yeah, we saw him do it, when you corroborate an eyewitness testimony with other eyewitnesses, that testimony becomes more reliable. Here's what's interesting about Jesus Christ. Are you there back in Luke 1.1? 1, 1? Notice what Luke said in verse 1. He says, for as much as many, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of these things which are most surely believed among us. Luke said, there are many people that have taken it amongst themselves to write down this story. They thought it was important enough to write down this story. Luke says there are many. And here's the thing. We know for sure there's at least four. We've got the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all documenting the story of Christ. And those were inspired by the Word of God. But you know that there's other people, even during the time of Christ, that documented his existence, his death, and all those things? And Luke says this, he says, there are many that have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of these things. And you got to ask yourself this question. What would you have to do in your life to get somebody to write down your life story? I mean, I'm not talking about you writing down your life story. I'm talking about what would you have to accomplish in life? What would I have to accomplish in life to, to make such an impact where somebody else would say, i got to write this down. Somebody needs to know about this. Okay, here's what's interesting. For the life of Christ, not just one person, many, many people decided that this is such an incredible story. This is such an incredible event. This is such an important event that we've got to document the fact that we were eyewitnesses of what happened. According to UC Davis, what makes eyewitness uh, accounts reliable? Well, number one, the corroboration of evidence or other eyewitnesses. Do you have that with the resurrection of Christ? Yes, you do. Multiple eyewitnesses telling. 500 at one time, Paul would tell you who all would stand up and say, I saw the living Messiah, I saw the resurrected Christ. Here's the second thing that makes eyewitness testimony credible. Not only the fact that it is corroborated by other eyewitnesses or evidence, but the second thing is this, the confidence level of the eyewitness, uh, of the person that, that is, is the witness. When they were doing the study, they began to not only have eyewitnesses who identify suspects and things, but they would ask them, what's your confidence level? High, medium, or low? High, medium, or low? And they found that people who had a low confidence would oftentimes end up pointing out the wrong guy in the lineup or accusing a, a wrong person. In fact, in the article, it tells a story of a lady who uh, had a, a guy had broken into her apartment and, and assaulted her and, and done things and and, and when they, the police showed up, and when they gave her, sus, she described the individual, and they bring, brought her pictures of people they thought it might be, she had a very low, she had a very low confidence level. She thinks, I think it was this guy, I'm pretty sure it was this guy, it was real low. By the time she went to court and was a witness in court, her mind and her memory had kind of crystallized, and by the time she was in court, she was like, yes, that's him. Ten years later, DNA proved that wasn't him. They found the real guy. But here's what they've learned. When someone initially has a low confidence level of what they saw, they, their eyewitness account is not reliable. But when someone initially has a high confidence level of what they saw, you have a more reliable eyewitness account. And when you can corroborate it with other eyewitnesses, then you have an even stronger 
uh, 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 reliability to that account. So here's a question I have for you. Is the eyewitness account of the resurrection of Christ corroborated with other eyewitnesses? The answer is yes. How about the confidence level of those who witnessed the resurrection of Christ? Go to Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 4. Remember the disciples? What were they acting like when Jesus was being crucified? They were acting like a bunch of scared individuals. And look, and I'm not blaming them. They, they could have been next. Remember Peter? A little maid was punking him. I mean, a little maid was like, I saw you. And he's like, I know not the man. They were scared. They were in hiding. They quit. They said, I go a fishing. But after they saw the resurrected Christ, their confidence level went up. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, and we could look at a lot of passages, but I'll just, I'll just point to one. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 4, the Bible says this. Acts chapter, excuse me, Acts 4. I must have wrote down the wrong the wrong, that's, that's the one I want, but that's a different one. Good night. Let me just read it for you. I have it here in my notes. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And I want you to notice that in that passage, they tell us that they saw these men who were once scared now they had boldness and confidence. Why? Because they had been with Jesus. Now, we like to spiritualize that, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this, where we'll say, like, hey, you spend time with Jesus, you'll be bold too. But here, it's not a spiritual thing like they were reading their Bible. They'd literally been with Jesus. They'd literally had breakfast with the resurrected Christ. And because of that, they had boldness. And the apostles who were scared and who were running and who were hiding after the resurrection came out with boldness onto the streets of Jerusalem and said, we have seen the resurrected Christ. And even though they were threatened, they were imprisoned, they were beaten, and all of them died for that testimony, their confidence level was high. UC Davis tells us that the reliability of eyewitness account goes up with the corroboration of evidence and other eyewitnesses. UC Davis tells us that the confidence level of the eyewitness account needs to go into account for the reliability, and their boldness was high. Here's the third thing. The amount of time is a factor. The amount of time. The initial identification is more important in how confident they were than if it happens later because your mind can crystallize and you can make up memories and stories in your mind of things that happened years later. But at that time, in that moment, the closer you are to the event, the more reliable it is. Here's what's interesting about your New Testament and my New Testament. Go, you're there in Acts. Go to Acts chapter 2. And look at verse number 31. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 31, the Bible says this. Acts 2, 31. I want you to notice that when Peter stood up in that day of Pentecost sermon, it was a big witness and testimony of what he had seen. Notice Acts 2.31. He's seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Notice he's saying, look, we saw the resurrected Christ. And what happened at the end of the day of Pentecost? Notice verse 41. Then they that gladly received his, word, uh, re received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want you to understand this and get this. The Bible tells us that after the day of Pentecost, there was 3,000 followers of Christ, 3,000 followers of Christ. Not 500 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Not 50 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because stories can be taken and can be changed over years and decades and centuries. They can be turned into myths and legends. And if there were 3,000 followers and believers of Christ 500 years after the event, then that might fall under the category of every other religion in this world. But please understand this. There were 3,000 believers of Jesus Christ, not 500 years after the event, not 50 years after the event, 50 days after the event. 50 days, the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. 
50 days after the resurrection of Christ, 3,000 people believed on him. And this, is, and this is the story of the book of Acts. Notice verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Look at Acts 4.4. That's what I uh, had you look at uh, earlier. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. In Acts 2, we have 3,000. In Acts 4, we've got 5,000. Look at uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse number 1. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says that in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, look at uh, verse 7, same chapter, the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied. See, the eyewitnesses, it's not like these stories were written down and they came out 500 years later. No, they came out at the time, the eyewitnesses documented this at the time of their lives while there were other eyewitnesses still alive, while there were contemporaries and peers living among them. This is important, and it is important because of this reason. Because the Bible, because the Bible is a document, and we're talking specifically about the New Testament, that was written by eyewitnesses, documented by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, during the time of their contemporaries, and they had thousands of followers in that lifespan, 70 years, 90 years, 100 years after the event. That means that the Bible would have been a falsifiable document. What does that mean? The word falsifiable means the capacity for some proposition, statement, theory, or hypothesis to be proven wrong. See, the problem with much of religion is that it's not falsifiable. The Bible being written by eyewitnesses during the lifespan of contemporary eyewitnesses would mean that it, the Bible is falsifiable. When a claim is made that cannot be tested, that is not a strong claim. When a claim is made that cannot be tested, that is not a strong claim. The claim of the disciples, they weren't like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus came back to us. Oh, can we see him? Well, he only appeared to us like nobody else. Look, he, they, they said it was just us four in this tower and nobody else saw him. No, Paul says, hey, 500 people saw him. All 12 apostles saw him. Now, look, the Bible is clear that only saved people saw the resurrected Christ. But there was many of them who saw it and it was falsifiable. Here's what I mean by religions that are not, that are, that are not falsifiable. The Quran. The Quran has a story in it about Muhammad performing a miracle where he went up to the moon and split the moon and did this miracle up in the moon. Well, here's the thing. That's not falsifiable. Can I go prove that? Can anybody go up to the moon and, and attest to the fact that Muhammad actually did what he said he did on the moon? That is a cunning, not even cunningly, that's just a foolishly devised fable. Do you understand that? The Bible that you and I believe in is not, it's not that. It's eyewitness accounts, eyewitnesses who documented these things and wrote them down for us. And look, by eyewitness standards, it's reliable eyewitness, corroborated by other eyewitnesses. It is reliable because of the confidence level. It is reliable because of the amount of time in which they came out with their story. They didn't come out with their story once everybody was dead, once nobody that could prove it wrong was gone. They didn't know. They came out with their story within days, weeks of what had happened. And they said, we've seen the resurrected Christ. So the Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents that were documented by eyewitnesses. And here's the next statement, the last part of the statement, which testify of the work of God in this world. Which testify of the work of God in this world. Go back to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1, look at verse 7. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. And this is, of course, talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter, Peter's testifying to the fact, he's like, let me give you an example of a miracle that I heard. I was on the Mount with him, and I audibly heard the voice of God saying about Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. See, the Bible is a collection of reliable ancient historic documents that were documented by eyewitnesses which testify to the work of God in this world. And I don't have time, I'm out of time, 
But the way that we know that is through a couple of things. First of all, through the fulfillment of specific prophecies and through the witness of supernatural miracles. And I'm not going to take the time to develop that. I don't have time to develop that. I preached entire sermons on that in the past when we talk about the reliability of Scripture. But the reason that we know that the Bible was not written by man is because 700 and 1,000 years before the events happened, people prophesied very specifically what would happen. That could not have been orchestrated by anyone other than God. And look, and, and people sometimes they say, oh, well, okay, well, you're talking about the New Testament. You're talking about Jesus. But what about the Noahic flood? Can you prove that? What about Jonah and the whale? Can you prove that? What about Adam and Eve? Isn't that uh, mystical? What about the writings of Moses? Well, here's what you need to understand. Our, the foundation of our belief is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason we're gathered here tonight, the only reason we're gathered as a church is because of the Lord Jesus Christ and His resurrection. God never expected us to blindly believe in the resurrection. He gave us a New Testament with doc which documents from eyewitnesses corroborated by other eyewitnesses the fact that this event actually happened. And here's what you need to know. If the resurrection happened, which it did, and look, logically speaking, if, if you say, well, I don't believe in the resurrection, then you can't believe in the Civil War, then you can't believe in, in, in anything that's ever happened in history because the only reason we know anything has happened in history is because eyewitnesses wrote it down for us. And, and here's the thing. You, you say, okay, well, you prove the resurrection. Well, that's all we need to prove. Because if the resurrection happened, then Jesus was who he said he was. He was the Son of God. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. Say, well, what does that do for, for all those stories in the Old Testament? Well, here's the thing. Jesus affirmed and confirmed the story of Jonah. Jesus affirmed and confirmed the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah. He affirmed and confirmed the Noahic flood. He affirmed and confirmed the writings of Moses. He talked about the law and the prophets. He, look, Jesus believed in the, he affirmed and confirmed Adam and Eve. He mentioned and talked about Adam and Eve. Jesus believed in Adam and Eve, in the Noahic flood, in Jonah and the whale. He believed all that. And if the resurrection is true, and he is who he said he is, then all of it's good. Amen. Then all of it's believable. All of it's reliable. The Bible is a reliable document by any way and any standard that you look at it. Amen. The Bible is a collection of reliable ancient historic documents that were documented by eyewitnesses which testify of the work of God in this world through the fulfillment of specific prophecies and through the witness of supernatural miracles. That's what you and I hold in our hands. It's not a cunningly devised fable. It is the word of God. Let's finish our passage, 2 Peter 1, look at verse 19. So Paul, Peter, with that in mind, pens these words. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Isn't that true? Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. By the Holy Ghost. Here's, here's, all, here's, here's all Peter's telling us, and here's all I'm trying to tell you. The Bible is not given by man, it was given by God. The Bible is a reliable book because it was given by God. But if you want a more sophisticated way of saying it, you can say it this way The Bible is a collection of reliable ancient and historic documents that were documented by eyewitnesses which testify of the work of God in this world through the fulfillment of specific prophecies and through the witness of supernatural miracles. It's a more sure word of prophecy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the fact that your word can be tested. Thank you for the fact that there have been hundreds and thousands of archaeological excavations, and none of them have ever or will ever disprove the Bible. And Lord, we love you for giving us your word, for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to walk out of here tonight just confident in the reliability of this book. 
In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're now, Brother Matt.